Hey everybody, welcome. Uh, today I have a special book for you. It's not actually mine, it's my wife's. She's had it since I believe she was in seventh grade. So it is The Art of the Dragonlance Saga. And it's based on our first book we read together in the beginning of the year. And it is edited by Mary Kirchhoff. Not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but you can see some excellent art of the Floating Citadel. We did not get to see the Floating Citadel in the first book we read together, so I guess slight spoiler there, but I think you'll be all right. So the art of the Dragonlance Saga. I'm not going to cover the entire book in this, but I'm going to get as far as I can in the time we have for this week. So it was published in 1987. And we'll start with In the Beginning. In the Beginning. I'm going to attach uh, PDFs in our Google Classroom, but I'll also give it a read here too for you. Hopefully that works out all right. I'll also try to add some of my own commentary here so you know what's going on with things. Hopefully that helps. Let's see. Get ourselves zoomed in. There we go. Somewhere, this world of print exists, and we're all part of it, says Tracy Hickman, co-author of Dragonlance Saga. The gods of Kryn came together in May 1983 to discuss the creation of the world. They didn't meet in the fabled halls of Valhalla, nor upon Mount Olympus. They met in an old hotel in downtown Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, a hotel that had been converted into an office building and was the corporate headquarters of the largest, most successful role-playing game company in the world, TSR Hobbies Incorporated. The hotel was not a prestigious meeting place for the gods. They still tell the tale, in fact, of the designer who fell through the floor of the third-story office. Hearing a crash, one of the top executives was considerably startled to look up and see a foot sticking through his ceiling. Out of the chaos in the heavens, a world was formed. A world of wonder and danger, a world of romance and daring, a world of laughter and tears. The world of the Dragonlance. The god who began to envision the possibility of this world in his mind was the god of marketing. This god ascended from his mighty throne one day in early 1983 and announced that he had done a survey, and according to the survey, People who played the Dungeons and Dragons game wanted more dragons. Therefore, said the god of marketing to the gods of NPD, new product design, give us dragons. The call went forth, the gods moved from their hotel into a new spacious building of carpets and modular cubicles, secure floors, computers, and no windows. Here it was that the designers of NPD brought forth their dragons and, after due consideration, one was chosen. This was a three-part tale, originally titled Eye of the Dragon, written by a new staff member from Salt Lake City, Utah, Tracy Hickman. To Hickman and to Harold Johnson, manager of NPD, who was given the responsibility of creating the world and all that lived therein. Harold and I spent a weekend at my house, begins Hickman. My house, interrupts Johnson. No, my house was the first meeting, returns Hickman. Your house was the second meeting. Johnson shakes his head. Anyway, Hickman continues, we spent one, week when, one weekend somewhere coming up with what would eventually be the basic plot and characters. You see, continues Johnson, we wanted something more than a Kill the Dragon of the Month series, which is what marketing was proposing. We were tired of the old hack and slash modules, and we figured our players were tired of those too. We wanted a game with depth, a game where there was more than just the monster. Kill it, snatch the treasure, find the next monster. The two developed a plot based on a group of diverse adventurers searching for an ancient artifact to rid the world of an ancient legendary evil, dragons. We wanted the dragons to be really awesome, 
Hickman says, dragons in some of the games were so wimpy, a part of gully dwarves could have a party of gully dwarves could have killed them. We wanted our dragons to be fearsome, really tough, and so we made them non-existent in this world at first. They were supposedly only creatures of legend. We played it up big, so that when our players finally meet a dragon, they're scared out of their socks, and deservedly so. It was also decided at this time to develop characters people could play if they chose. These were to be the heroes of the lance, and each character would represent one of the character classes in the game. Fighter, magician, cleric, thief, and so forth. That was a controversial idea, Hickman recalls. Some people predicted it would be the downfall of the series. They said players liked playing their own characters and would resent having to play others. We made it a choice. Players could bring their own characters into this world, or they could play the ones we developed. As it turned out, the characters we developed became so popular, people started taking them into other campaigns. At this point, NPD, oh, it's fixing the glare. At NPD needed to present their idea to the supreme gods of management. In order to have an impressive package, the creators of Crin needed what is called concept art to give management an idea of the product's look. Harold and I spent one afternoon describing Crin and its people and creatures to Larry Elmore, TSR staff artist. We particularly concentrated on the characters since these were one of the most important elements in the game. Larry was so excited by the concept that he went home and in one weekend, on his own time, produced the four original Dragonlance paintings portraying the major characters and events. The gods of management looked with favor upon the world and Project Overlord, as it was codenamed, went into high gear. A larger design team was formed under the leadership of project designer Hickman. By this time, the project had grown considerably in scope. What began as a three-part series... Sorry, I lost my place. What began as a three-game module series was now a proposed 12-module series, plus a trilogy of adult novels, a full-color calendar by T.S. Our staff artists, miniatures, toys, and articles, and short stories. The new design team began forging the world. The meetings were long and certainly not dull, recalls Hickman laughing. There were arguments and debates, as there should be in creative sessions. We were, after all, doing something that no game company had ever attempted before now. Producing game modules with a connecting storyline and characters that would carry over from one module to the next. Does this sound familiar to anybody who's played modern role-playing games? Because this is where it all came from, people. All these modern role-playing games. Right? Here's uh, one of the original color roughs, you know, Oils and Acrylics by Larry Elmore. Man, I wish I was talented enough to have that be my rough, right? Look at this. It's awesome. Gold Moon, Riverwind, and Tasselhoff, right? We've got some red dragons. People mark, being marched. It's fantastic. So, growing in all aspects of their lives, one discussion centered around the halfling character class and went something like this. Should we have halflings? General cries of yes and no. Our players like them. I say we leave them in. I say they go to Tolkien. Let's come up with a new race then. Small, childlike, no furry feet, general consensus. Let's make them natural-born thieves. Hey, I object to a race of thieves. What if they steal just because they're curious? They don't really mean to take anything, and they don't steal for gain. And so the race of the Kender, and the character of Tasselhoff Burfoot, was born. The world of Kryn was all divided into three major races. To coincide with a theme that was rapidly developing, the balance of the world between good, evil, and neutral, and how that balance needed to be maintained. in order to keep the clockwork of the world in motion. The elves represented the extreme good, the ogres extreme evil, while humans were the race that swung the pendulum, free to choose between the two. Added to this were the creatures of the world, including dragons as the highest of their order, again divided in three groups, good dragons, evil dragons, and neutral dragons. Then came the minor races. Let's take a little peek here at 
a dragon high lord in their armor kitiara who we don't see in the first book but we hear mention of and there's sturm right looking so stern and you won't find out about that dude over there this crazy looking elf and this green dragon and all that kind of stuff until the second book but it's well worth it and you can see right here this is the blood sea of a star which i had mentioned before Created by accident, dwarves, kender, and gnomes. At the beginning of the story, the races were divided and polarized because of the recent destruction of the world during the Cataclysm. One of the lessons taught in the story is that the differing races must learn to put aside their petty jealousies and hatreds in order to join together to defeat the evil that threatens them. The original group of companions, the Inn Fellows, was made up of a representative from most of the races. The party itself carried out the theme. Some of the characters were good, Stern, Caramon, some neutral, Tannis, Tasselhoff, Flint, Raceland, and one evil, Kitiara. Of these, the leader of the group, Tannis, carried the theme further in that he was a half-elf, divided within himself, in love with an elf maiden, Lorana, who represented good, and a human woman, Kitiara, who was evil. The memories of who created what particular character have become blurred. Harold Johnson is credited with developing the character.